Today we're going to be talking about nucleic acids. And nucleic acids are large polymers made up of nucleotides. They come in two varieties. They come in RNA and they come in DNA. And these molecules, their function is to store information. Information that's later going to be used to make a protein. Now, we're going to start by drawing a nucleotide, the monomer. And the nucleotide is made up of three parts. It's going to be made up of a sugar, a phosphate, and a nitrogenous base. So let's start by drawing the sugar first. So I'm going to draw a house, kind of with the sides caved in a little bit. There's a, a sugar. And the house has a cherry on top, really an oxygen atom. And each one of these corners is represented by a carbon. So that's one carbon, two, three, four, and the fifth carbon is a branch off the main structure. Now, down below, we're going to add some functional groups. We're going to add a hydroxyl group and another hydroxyl group. And that is going to be our sugar. Now, the sugars actually come in two varieties. So let's go ahead and write that down. The sugars come in two varieties, ribose and deoxyribose. Now, ribose is going to be found in RNA. And what I've drawn is ribose. And ribose actually has an oxygen here in the second position, meaning the oxygen is attached to the second carbon of this sugar. And DNA contains deoxyribose. And the only difference between these two sugars is this oxygen. It's attached to the second carbon. That's the only difference between deoxyribose and ribose. But it's a big difference because ribonucleic acid, RNA, only has to be around for about a day to do its job. DNA has to be around for a lifetime. So we want really, really, really stable DNA. And one of the ways we're going to get that stability is by making it out of a very stable sugar. And it turns out that oxygen is, is a bit of a reactive element. So if we actually remove the oxygen from here, this becomes a more stable molecule. And if we add the oxygen back, it becomes uh, less stable. So there we are. This is ribose again. Now the next part of the molecule is going to be a phosphate. I'm going to add a phosphate to the uh, five prime carbon. And I'm going to add an oxygen and then a phosphorus, double bond, oxygen, OH, OH. And that is a phosphate. And the sugar and the phosphate are both very polar molecules, very hydrophilic. And when you're thinking of DNA, anyhow, DNA is double-stranded. The sugar phosphate tend to form a sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, a sugar phosphate backbone. And that backbone actually interacts with the nucleoplasm. It interacts with the water that the nucleoplasm is made out of because water is hydrophilic and the sugar and the phosphate are very hydrophilic. All right, the third part is going to be a nitrogenous base, and it's connected to the first carbon. And it's called a nitrogenous base. Because this molecule, and these come in different varieties, and we'll talk about those in a second, these nitrogenous bases actually contain nitrogen, hence the word nitrogenous, and a nitrogenous base. And yes, they actually are those acid-base type bases, or pH type structures. This is a base, so it has a tendency to accept hydrogen ions, and that's why they call it a nitrogenous base. Now, the nitrogenous base comes in different forms. So let's go through the different forms. One form is adenine, abbreviated capital A. Another form is guanine, capital G. And then we're going to have thymine, capital T, 
cytosine, capital C, and uracil, capital U. Now, these two right here are going to be referred to as purines because they actually have a structure like this. They're made of two fused rings. Again, the corners are made up of carbon and hydrogen, uh, not carbon, carbon and nitrogen. Now, there's one ring, and the other ring, there it is, is a pentagon. So these are fused rings. That's a purine ring. The other three are going to be pyrimidines. And they are just a hexagon. It's a single hexagonal ring. Again, with carbons and nitrogens at the corners. Now, it turns out that purines and pyrimidines, at least in DNA, like to pair up. They like to pair up via hydrogen bonds. So a purine will always pair with a pyrimidine. And there are some base pairing rules that we should learn. And the rules go like this. Adenine likes to pair up with thymine. And guanine likes to pair up with cytosine. And little uracil, we'll talk about him later. And I'll, we'll say one thing about uracil is uracil is only going to be found in RNA. And thymine is only going to be found in DNA. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about DNA replication, transcription, translation, when we talk about how information, how nucleotide information is turned into a protein. All right. Now, because we have one, two, three, four, five different nitrogenous bases, we actually have five different varieties of nucleotides. And it's the sequence of nucleotides, that sequence of different nucleotides, that encodes the information that's used to make proteins. Think of different letters and how different letters can make up different words. Well, the same thing here with DNA. The different letters, the different nucleotides, depending on their sequence, create information. And this information is then used to make a protein. All right, let's take a look at the numbering system one more time. One, two, three, four, five. That's how the carbons are numbered on the sugar. And we actually add a little apostrophe called a prime to the numbers. We say the one prime carbon, the two prime carbon, the three prime, the four prime, the five prime carbon. Now, the numbering system is very important here because obviously the phosphate is always attached to the five prime carbon. And depending on whether this oxygen is there or missing, determines whether this sugar is going to be a ribose or a deoxyribose sugar. And over here, this three prime carbon, it's attached to this hydroxyl group, which is going to lead us into the next topic. And that's how do we connect up these nucleotides? It turns out that they are connected up in a certain way. And it turns out when we add the next nucleotide, it's always going to be connected to this hydroxyl group attached to the three prime carbon. Never here, never here, never anywhere else. And that's because this chemical reaction is helped facilitate, it's helped facilitated by enzymes. And enzymes are so specific. They only do the same thing over and over and over. So the chemical reaction is only going to occur between the phosphate of this nucleotide and the hydroxyl group attached to the three prime carbon. In fact, let's go ahead and show that. So I'm going to erase this. We're going to draw another nucleotide, this time a little smaller, maybe a little bit simpler. And we're going to connect another nucleotide to it. So here's my nucleotide. Remember, it's a house with the side caves in. Got a little cherry on top, a little carbon uh, chain, a little carbon uh, branch. And then I think of it as some wheels. OH, there's a hydroxyl group. OH, there's a hydroxyl group. There's our nitrogenous base. I'll just put NB. And we're going to have a phosphate. 
So O attached to a P, double bind O, OH, OH. So there's our phosphate. That's a nucleotide. That's a ribonucleotide found in RNA. Now let's go ahead and number these. One, two, three, four, five, and put the little prime. There we go. I'm going to draw another nucleotide down here. And here we go, house with the sides caved in, cherry on top, carbon uh, branch, two wheels, hydroxyl groups for wheels. It's going to have a nitrogenous base attached to the one prime carbon. And let's go ahead and attach our phosphate, our oxygen attached to a phosphorus double bond O, bond OH bond OH. And what we're going to do here is we're going to connect these two together via a dehydration reaction. So it's the same theme over and over and over applied to different situations. In fact, when this nucleotide is being made, the sugar is actually connected to the phosphate via a dehydration reaction. The sugar is connected to the nitrogenous base via a dehydration reaction. And that, we're going to continue in that same theme, and we're going to connect the two nucleotides via a dehydration reaction. So here we go. What I'm going to do is I'm going to break the chemical bond between the phosphorus and the oxygen. So essentially I'm going to break off the hydroxyl group. And then I'm going to break the chemical bond between the oxygen and the hydrogen. And I'm going to grab these atoms. So here we go. And we are going to remove those atoms. So they get removed as a water molecule. That's why it's called a dehydration reaction, because we're removing the water molecule from this structure. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to erase this, because those atoms are gone. They're, they're actually not gone from the universe, but they went out to join the other atoms, or the other uh, molecules in the body. So, there goes our water molecule, and this is what we're left with. And then we're actually going to join up the phosphorus to the oxygen atom, just like that, and create a nice new covalent bond. And we're going to do that over and over and over. And these nucleic acids can get very long. They can get hundreds to thousands to even millions of nucleotides long. And again, the information is encoded in the sequence, you know, because they have different bases, the sequence of nucleotides. Now I want to turn, uh, talk about one last thing, and that's kind of this numbering system again. One prime, two prime, three prime, four prime, five prime. And we say DNA and RNA have a direction associated with them. So the direction in this case is going to be 5 prime to 3 prime. And you can see here that the phosphate is going to be the beginning of this nucleic acid and it's attached to the 5 prime carbon. That's why we start, we say the direction is 5 prime to 3 prime. And in a sense the nucleic acid ends where if we, we could attach another nucleotide if we wanted to but eventually the last nucleotide is still going to end right here. It's going to end with that hydroxyl group attached to the three prime carbon. So that we say that DNA has a direction or polarity associated with it, five prime to three prime. And that is going to be super important. This is especially important when we're talking about DNA because DNA is double stranded. And it turns out that one strand goes in this direction, and the other strand goes in the opposite direction. So it still goes 5 prime to 3 prime, but in the opposite direction. And that's important because in order for these two strands to base pair, these, these bases to pair up via hydrogen bonds, they have to be going in opposite directions, or the bases aren't going to line up properly and they're not going to form those hydrogen bonds. So these strands are going to be going in opposite directions. And you can see that they're parallel to each other. They're just going in opposite directions. And there's going to be a special name for that. We say that DNA, the two strands of DNA, are anti-parallel.
because they're parallel, they're side by side, but they're going in opposite directions. So hence the word anti. And again, they go in opposite directions so that they can actually base pair and form double-stranded uh, molecules, double-stranded DNA. And that is going to be it for nucleic acids.